Good morning, Trace Church. So, so glad to be with you this morning. Look, I don't intend to solve anything as complex as was demonstrated on that pre-roll. Man, if you're squeezing the tube of toothpaste from the middle, right, or you put the toilet paper on to unroll from the bottom, all I can say is I'm going to be praying for you this morning, okay? Uh, I am starting a new series called Relationship Goals. This morning I'm talking about marriage. I am super, super excited to get to share with you today. But I do want to say if you're not married, I still want you to tune in. Uh, This lesson is not just for people who are married, it's for anybody who's got a pulse, which means everybody. And here's what I would like to say. uh, The same biblical principles, when applied, that make for a great marriage are the same principles that make for a great life. So I hope that you can take what I'm going to share today and apply it to any relationship in which you're a part, especially in your marriage to those of you who are married. Uh, So I teach in CCU's grad counseling program. I heard a story years ago uh, about a counselor who was starting his counseling training. And he was this ambitious young guy. And his first day of his first class, after the class, he walks up to his professor and he says, Dr. So-and-so, I'm going to write a book on marriage. And the professor kind of does an internal eye roll and says, okay, what's the title of the book going to be, young man? And he says, The Ten Commandments of Marriage. The professor's like, all right, why don't you keep learning and keep growing? Let's see what happens as time passes. So guy graduates, gets married, been married for a couple of years, goes back to the professor, says, sir, I'm still thinking about writing the book, but the title has changed. And the professor's like, okay, what's the title changed to? And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to title the book, Eight Principles of Marriage. Eight Principles of Marriage. The professor's like, all right, keep learning, keep growing. Let's see what happens as time passes. So some more time passes. Guy has a couple of kids, still married. Decides he better go back and check in with the professor. He says, Dr. So-and-so, I still want to write the book, but the title's changed again. And the professor's like, all right, what's the new title? And the guy says, A Few Thoughts About Marriage. A couple of months later, the guy enters marital treatment and decides he's not going to write a book at all. Marriage is tough, ladies and gentlemen. That's the point. Marriage is tough. Let me prove it to you with another illustration really quickly. If you're married, raise your hand. If you're married, raise your hand. If you're watching online, raise your hand. Now, keep your hands up just for a second. Humor me. If you've ever had an argument with your spouse, put your hand down. If you've ever had an argument with your spouse. So around the room, nobody else has their hands up any longer, just so you guys know who are watching online. Every couple fights, right? Every couple argues. Every marriage experiences seasons of suffering. None of that's unusual. But I do want to give a little disclaimer before we get into our content today. While seasons of suffering and struggle are not unusual in marriage, domestic violence is unusual. And, um, I, you know, being, having worked with families for years uh, and having taught about marriage for years, I always feel it's important on the front end to put in this little disclaimer. God's will and plan for any marriage is reconciliation and restoration, period, end of discussion, okay? But in domestic violence situations, usually you need more help if, if that would apply to you than just hearing a sermon because sometimes scripture is actually used to manipulate in situations like that. So if you've ever been in a domestic violence situation, I encourage you to get some professional help. If that applies to anybody in this room or anybody watching online, call Trace Church. Uh, the pastors at Trace have some resources that they can equip you with or they can direct you to that will help begin the process of reconciliation reconciliation and restoration in your marriage. And then a lot of what I am going to say today will apply to you because it is God's will that you have the kind of marriage that he intends for you to have. And that's the thrust of what I want to talk about this morning. How, what in the world can you do to have the kind of marriage that God intends for you to have? And this, this morning, I don't want to share anything new. It's not my intention to plow new ground or share something that you haven't already heard. Um, I want to remind you of things you probably already know are true that I just want you to start putting into practice a little bit better now than maybe you ever have. I had a mentor who almost every time I saw him for, for years would say, hey, Trent, remember Repetition is your friend. 
And that's true. In life, repetition is our friend. None of us learned the multiplication tables the first time we saw them. But after enough repetition, a lot of us can recall immediately that eight times eight is 72. So, so repetition is a required, it's actually 64. I'm just having a little fun with you this morning. Um, repetition is a required ingredient for learning, okay? And I, I wanna repeat to you, again, some things I, I bet you already know are true. The secret uh, to having the relationship God intends for you to have is that you must become and by that I mean think, feel, and act more and more like Jesus every single day. That's the secret. That's, that's really all there is to it. And this is so simple, it's just not easy to do in the trenches of everyday life. And if you were to read the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you were to look at how Jesus thinks, feels, and acts, you would see that there are really two um, uh, foundational principles upon which all Jesus' thinking, feeling, and action are built. And I want to share those two with you. The first is that Jesus loved God with all his heart, with all his soul, mind, and his strength. And the second principle upon which all Jesus' thinking, feeling, and action is built is on his love for other people. And so those are really the two required ingredients to having the kind of marriage God intends for you to have. So I wanna talk about that first one right now. I wanna talk about really how to love God fully. That's the first required uh, ingredient to have the kind of marriage God's, God intends. It's for you to really fully love God. Now this is a primary theme in the scriptures but I want to focus on Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10 to illustrate this point. What in the world does it look like to fully love God? So here's this text, all right? And the Bible says, in him, in God, you have been made complete, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Ladies and gentlemen, you are made complete by being united with God through Jesus Christ, the Son. You are not complete in your relationship with your spouse. That's not how God designed you. First step in having the marriage God intends for you to have is to acknowledge that it is in God you find everything in life you've ever been looking for. And what does the lifestyle look, uh, look like for the person who's finally realized that truth? Man, that person fellowships with God by reading God's word. That person fellowships with God by praying. That person fellowships with God by fellowshipping with God's people, by living as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and being on mission as a citizen of that same kingdom. All too often in marriage, individuals are looking to their spouse, not to God to complete them. I hear couples say this kind of stuff all the time. I'll hear somebody say, Trent, I, I know what I'm looking for in life is I'm gonna find it when my spouse makes me feel like the center of the known universe. Or I'll hear somebody say, Trent, I know I'm gonna find uh, everything in life I've been looking for when my spouse makes my wildest sexual fantasies come true. Or Trent, I know I'll find everything in life that I'm looking for when my spouse and I just communicate perfectly and we don't argue and we're always on the same page. And here's what's tough about marriage. When marriage is going great, it really does kind of feel like it completes you. And we call that the honeymoon phase of relationships when we're referring to that season of a relationship where it really feels like the other person completes me right? And in this season, man, it feels like this relationship has what it takes to really make my wildest dreams come true. And most young couples who are in the honeymoon phase, they report feeling like a boundless energy, man. They're up on the phone till like 3 a.m. and they get up at 6 a.m. and they're back on the phone and they sleep two hours a night, all every night of the week, and they're just in love and, and, and their potential is unlimited, and then at some point in marriage, every couple comes to the harsh 
realization that they did not, in fact, marry the second incarnation of Jesus Christ and that their spouse is flawed, their spouse is terminally human. And in relationships, those flaws cause pain, and that pain influences anybody uh, who experiences it to seek pain relief. One of the easiest ways to do that in a relationship is just to withdraw, to put up your wall and get distant from your spouse and unfortunately distant from God. And then we end up feeling isolated and alone. And I hope that after this lesson, that kind of pain, instead of driving you away from, from God, drives you towards God. Friend, God will never, ever hurt you. He will never, ever leave you. He will never forsake you. He will not abandon you. He will not betray you. God is kind. God is just. God is merciful. God is graceful. God loves you. And in God, you will be made complete if you genuinely seek for complete and total satisfaction in him. And when you do, you'll have accomplished the first and most critical step in having the kind of relationship that God intends for you to have. You gotta first fully love God to have the kind of relationship God intends for you to have. The second thing you gotta do, and this is that second attribute of Jesus that we talked about, to have the marriage God intends, you've gotta love your spouse as Jesus loves them. Love your spouse as Jesus loves them. So that first principle we talked about is kind of following the lifestyle of Jesus. This would be following the love style of Jesus. And if we look at the life of Jesus, the way he loved can kind of be broken down into three different categories. Altruistic love, sacrificial love, and forgiving love. And so I wanna talk about those a little bit this morning. In marriage... To, to have the relationship God intends, you cannot operate the way human beings normally operate in relationships. And the way we normally operate in relationships is with this mindset of reciprocity, a reciprocity mindset. And in Latin, we call it a quid pro quo. So you learned a little Latin today in the sermon. And here's what that mindset is. That mindset, a quid pro quo kind of reciprocity mindset means I'm willing to do something in this relationship as long as it benefits me. But the altruistic love style of Jesus says the opposite. I'm willing to do what is in the best interest of my spouse regardless of whether or not it benefits me. That's altruistic love. And our culture tells us the exact opposite. Our culture says, love only as long as it benefits you. Love only as long as it's easy. Love only as long as it feels good. And stop loving if it feels like work. Because according to our culture, love shouldn't feel like work. And culture says if it feels like work, it must not be meant to be. Jesus showed us that love, altruistic love, is actually the opposite. Let me give you a scripture to illustrate the point. This is John chapter 13 and verse 1. And the scriptures say, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, catch this, he loved them to the end. Now let me tell you what's about to happen right after this meal. Jesus' closest followers, who were his dearest friends and actually more like family, were about to really, really hurt him. They would doubt whether or not what he had taught them was true. They would deny publicly that they even knew him. They would abandon him in his moment of greatest need and they would even turn him over to a group of people who would eventually be responsible for murdering him, the ultimate betrayal. And Jesus loved them anyway. They denied that they even knew him and he loved them anyway. 
They doubted whether or not what he said was true, and they loved him anyway. They abandoned him, and he loved them anyway. They betrayed him, and he loved them anyway. Jesus loved them. He never stopped loving them, and he loved them even to the very end. That's altruistic love. And that's the kind of love Jesus wants you to have for your spouse. Man, when they hurt you, love them anyway. When they withdraw from you, love them anyway. When they're acting selfish and they're not meeting your needs, love them anyway. Keep loving them and don't stop loving them and love them to the very end. If we look at the style of love that Jesus demonstrated, we don't just see that it's altruistic. We, th- we see that it's also sacrificial. And what that means according to Jesus is a willingness to not only give my life for my spouse, but to live my life for my spouse. I think marriages struggle in America primarily because Christians are so comfortable You know this, but there are literally millions and millions of Christians across the world who could be put to death for gathering in a place like this publicly. Just to profess faith is a death sentence for some of them. In America, that's not the case. In our culture, we're trained to think that we really are the center of the world. When you're driving home from work, think about this. Isn't it all those other vehicles who are in your way? When you're at the supermarket after hours because you don't have food to cook for the next day, aren't those long and cumbersome lines inconveniencing you? We're trying to think in our culture that we deserve comfort, that people should just revolve around what we want when we want it. And this way of thinking is common to us all because we're so saturated in comfort. And the more comfortable you are, the lower your tolerance is for sacrifice. And so when marriage doesn't just ask for occasional sacrifice, but demands daily sacrifice, most people abandon ship because their threshold to tolerate genuine sacrifice is so low. Because if I'm being honest, we're all a little bit spoiled. So sometimes people will push back with me on this, right? I'm from the South. Uh, and, and mostly men will push back on me, you know, these big burly guys. Like, Trent, uh, man, um, just hang on a minute there. Uh, I, I'd, I'd take a bullet for my wife, man. Any day, anytime, anywhere. I'd give my life for her. Come on, man. And look, that really is chivalrous, right? And, and honorable, and I appreciate it. But the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was not so marvelous and so wonderful because he willingly gave his life in a moment for each of us. It was marvelous and wonderful because for 33 years, Jesus lived every day of his life with you in mind. And he resisted sin every day so that he could be a spotless sacrifice for you and that his righteousness could be exchanged for your unrighteousness so that you could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it's not just about having a willingness to give your life for your spouse. You gotta be willing to live your life for your spouse. If we look at what that means in the scripture, that means a willingness to serve them, a willingness to be thoughtful about ways you could support them and willingness to act on those ways of supporting them whenever they come to mind. It also means pursuing your spouse. 
even when they're giving you the cold shoulder or got porcupine quills out, even when they're tired, even when you're tired, even when the benefit to that pursuit is minimal, every single day, you gotta live for your spouse if you wanna love them the way Jesus loves them. The last attribute of Jesus, if we boiled down his style of love into the most simple components would be to love your spouse with a forgiving love, a forgiving love. What that means according to Jesus is to let go of any hurt your spouse has caused, regardless of whether or not they've asked for forgiveness or even changed behavior. Everybody under the sound of my voice and watching online are scorekeepers. When we get hurt, we really do tend to write it in a ledger. And if we get hurt the same way at a later date, we just more deeply engrave that hurt into that ledger over and over and over and over again. And then any time in our present, we feel the pain of the past, we let all that pain crash into our present and infect our life in the moment we feel all that pain compounded. And that leads to bitterness, resentment, and can be a big cause of divorce for a lot of couples. But Jesus, uh, Jesus teaches us to forgive. This scripture is a hard one to read, but I want to put this on the screen for you. This is Luke 23, 34. What's tough about this is that Jesus really is one of my best friends. And at this moment in his story, he is on a cross being crucified. He's been beaten, he's been humiliated, and he's near death, and he's breathing his last breaths. And with his last breaths, he is literally eye to eye with the people who have crucified him. And he looks out at them, as his life's drawn to a close, barely able to breathe, and with one of his last breaths, he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think about that for a second, church. And think back to some of the moments you've lived through that hurt you the worst. And think about the words that were coming out of your mouth in that moment. And I don't know about you, but I know what was coming out of mine. And it didn't sound anything like, Father, forgive them. And if you're really gonna have the kind of relationship God intends, then you're gonna have to love people with the forgiving love that Jesus demonstrated. And even if you're looking into the eyes of someone who has hurt you so bad, it almost feels like they're ripping your heart out of, out of your chest. You say, Father, forgive them because I already have. Trace Church, God does not hold your sin to your charge. You should not hold your spouse's sin to their charge. So let it Go, let it go. Now that's a real sexy platitude, isn't it? Just let it go. And people will tell me, man, Trent, it'd just be nice if it was that easy. And what the heck does that mean anyway, let it go? To me, what that means is that when a thought pops into your mind of a past pain, you immediately think about something you're grateful for and you say to yourself the phrase, Father, forgive them for this because I already have. And you make a commitment not to bring the past hurts up. And anytime they pop into your mind, you combine them with the thoughts you're grateful for and you say it again, Father, forgive them for this because I already have. I'm gonna close, but before I close, I want you to do something that I have couples do from time to time. To me, this is important. We may have to bring the house lights up just a little bit for this, but I want you to get your phone out 
and I want you to point it right at this just lovely face right up here on the stage, right? Don't take a picture. It'll break your camera. But go ahead and get out your phone. Take just a second. Pull your phone out and point it right at me and put it right in front of your face. Get it right on me, all right? I know what you're thinking, man, Trish, your hairline, hairline's receding a little bit. You're right about that, but we don't talk about that in my home. Point it right at me. All right, you got it at me. Now, when it's pointed right at me, I want you to find the icon on your phone that flips your camera. Push it now. And I want you to keep looking at that image. The, you just flipped your camera, and now you're looking at somebody much prettier than me. And the person you are looking at is the person who today can take responsibility for the quality of your marriage and begin to act in ways that genuinely transform it. What I'm telling you, church, is that the responsibility is yours, not your spouse's, to start the process of reconciling and healing your relationship. You can put your phones down. This is just a simple process that's not easy to live out. And if you're genuinely willing to try, God will equip you with the capacity to live. Think, feel, and act just like Jesus did to really love God fully and to love your spouse like Jesus loves your spouse with an altruistic love, with a sacrificial love, and with a forgiving love. And if you'll do that, you'll have a relationship beyond what even your wildest dreams can comprehend. I want that for you. But even more than I do, God wants that for you. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example that he showed us in how he fully loved you and how he loved others, God, with an altruistic love, a sacrificial love, and a forgiving love. Lord, I just ask that you heal marriages uh, in this place and online. And I, and I just pray that each person would be willing to take responsibility for their relationship and begin to live this out starting today. God, I ask that Trace Church is just a lighthouse for hurting families. And I just pray you would draw people here and every family that is here or ever will walk through the doorways of Trace Church. God, I just ask that you would reconcile and restore we thank you so much for our time here today. We just ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.